Take it away, Laura and Cliff. Thank you so much, Cheryl, and welcome, everybody. And we are going to uh, go through an early morning here for Cliff. He's joining us from the West Coast, so uh, we really appreciate having him here. And this is not his first rodeo with Shore. He's done some wonderful webinars for us before. But today he's going to be telling us uh, how to make your rough recording sound anything but rough. And he'll also touch on some of our Motive microphones for iOS and Android. And just as a side note, I'm actually using the MV5 right now, and Cliff is using one as well. So he'll tell you a little bit more about that as we go through. But without any further ado, let's just let's get into Cliff. Let's introduce you, Cliff, and, and tell us a little bit about what you do and um, why we should listen to what you have to say. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Well, thank you, Cheryl, and thank you, Laura. And good morning or afternoon to everybody, depending on where you are in the world. So the reason I get to uh, talk uh, at my screen this morning is because I am a professional songwriter, music producer, and audio engineer. I've been doing this for basically a quarter of a century, which is a little daunting <laughs> when I put it that way. But I have uh, been associated with Shure for almost the entirety of my musical career. And I think it's super important that we talk about the value of rough recordings and some ways to bring up the quality of those rough recordings as we go. So that's why we're here today. So why don't we just start by using a, a definition so we can all be on the same page. For my, uh, for my way of thinking, a rough recording is any simple recording that you captured directly into your smartphone, your tablet, your laptop. And this is not a fully produced recording. This is typically a single instrument, either a piano or a guitar, plus a vocal. What you are essentially trying to do as a songwriter is capture your melody and your lyric and uh, your chordal arrangement. But that's it. Just super simple, super clear. So that's how I define rough recording um, when it comes to this sort of thing. One of the things that I get asked a lot, because I think when people think about songwriting, they, they tend to think about making a songwriter demo, which is usually much higher quality, um, meaning a big recording studio, you know, controlled rooms, that sort of thing. But there are lots of reasons to make a, a rough recording before you get to the point where you go into a studio to make your demo. First of all, and this is something that, that I've discovered over years of writing songs, during the songwriting process, since so much of songwriting is about kind of a stream of consciousness, almost brainstorming approach, if you have a recorder running, you are able to capture all these ideas as they happen, especially in a co-write where you're going back and forth with ideas and these ideas are happening sort of quickly. At some point, and this happens to me all the time in a writing session, I'll say to my collaborator, what was that thing you sang or said just a couple of minutes ago? That was so cool. We should go back to that. Well, if you're not recording during the session, the likelihood of rediscovering that is really slim. So I tend to keep a recording going the entire time I am writing. And that way, if there is that little bit of lightning in a bottle that you've captured, you can go back to that and find it without trying to, you know, rack your brains and, and remember what it was that you sang or said, you know, five, ten minutes before. Beyond that, and this is, this is actually really, really useful, the moment you finish writing a song, it is hugely important to have a record of that song so that, you know, a week, a month, two months, <laughs> believe it or not, a year later, you can go back and remember how that song went. You know, sometimes um, when you've written a lot of songs, it is actually genuinely hard to remember all of the songs and how they went if you don't make a recording, a rough recording, what I call the definitive rough recording of that song after the song is completed. Also, and this is a trick that I have used um, for a long time as well, there is no substitute for listening to your song the way an audience member would, as opposed to the way it sounds to you while you are singing it in the writing room or even performing it live. So there's a thing that happens when you sit down with your lyric sheet and listen back to your recording, like you're just listening to your song uh, on the radio or streaming from your uh, computer. It makes you listen to it the way a listener would, not the way a writer or a performer would. And it's amazing how many little tweaks 
present themselves that wouldn't have ordinarily. So having a quality rough recording is just another way of being able to refine the writing process. Then, moving forward, I mentioned demos earlier. If your song is one of those songs that you feel like is ready for prime time and you want to make a great studio recording of it, having that rough recording is ideal to give to the session musicians so they can learn the song, the singers, the demo singers in advance of the session so they can learn the song. It's just a really, really efficient, really clean way to capture your song and provide it to the, the necessary people in a session. And what's important about that is, you know, I have a lot of clients in my studio who think to themselves, well, I've been playing this song for years. I'm going to demo it now. So no big deal. I'll just bring my guitar to the studio and sing this to the demo singers or the studio musicians in the studio. The problem with that is the studio is a very intense, very concentrated, focused place. And it's really unnerving unless you spend a lot of time there to remember your song exactly like you want it performed. So this idea that you'll take up your guitar and go immediately to the second line of the second verse and play the players or the singer what they want to hear, it doesn't really work as smoothly or as cleanly as you would think. So having that rough recording that you can just call up and say, here's what I had in mind, and you can reference that spot on the recording, is hugely helpful and, and also marks you as a pro when it comes to working in the demo studio. And then finally, and this is something that comes up a lot too, I get asked a lot of times, well, you know, should I copyright my songs immediately after writing them? And, and the short answer is, no, you really don't need to copyright your song with the register of copyrights until a song is actually ready to go out for commercial release. But having a time-stamped recording of your song when it's actually been written is never a bad idea in terms of official proof that a song has been written. Whew. So that is why, lots of reasons why, uh, a good rough recording is so useful. And Cliff, just to jump in on that, I think one of our questions from a former time that we did this was the timestamp question. And we have the luxury now of recording most of our rough ideas and rough recordings into devices that we carry in our pockets. So can you talk about the timestamp just before we move on? Absolutely. So, so one of the things, and we will talk about this in greater depth later when we talk about some of the sure motive mics, but <clears throat> every time you make a recording, for example, into your smartphone, that file that you create in your smartphone comes with a date stamp and a timestamp on it that is embedded in the file, whether it's an MP3, whether it's a WAV file, that is what happens when you make a recording into your smartphone. And I, I know for a fact that the, the Shure um, Motive apps do that. And it's just a way of documenting the date and time of, of a recording. Wonderful. So now that Laura has given me a chance to breathe in, um, let's talk for a second about, about sound quality. A and this is something that, you know, granted, we are using the word rough when we talk about a rough recording. But nonetheless, the more clarity there is in your recording, the better it will capture the emotion and the intention of the songwriter. So what I mean by this is capturing that the, the, the quality of, even if you're not a professional singer or even an experienced singer or player, there is no substitute for what it sounds like when the songwriter is actually singing and playing their own song. So this recording, the higher the quality of this recording, the, the greater the likelihood that your emotion and your intention will translate to the demo singer and the studio musicians in the way that they interpret the song. It's, it's all about the emotion and the higher the quality of the recording, the better the clarity is and the better the, the emotion will translate. Also, one of the things that I have found is that if, if you are in fact a performer as well as a songwriter, getting a great recording even into your smartphone might make that recording pitchable. Sometimes, and I've done this plenty, uh, not myself personally, because I sing kind of like I talk, um, but when I'm working with a great, um, a great artist and we do a quick recording, if the emotion is there, if the quality is good, that's pitchable by itself. You don't necessarily have to go into uh, a bigger studio if you get a great performance that has that sort of magical thing about it. Now, if you are 
a performer as well as a songwriter, but you're sort of newer to the performing game, hearing yourself better and hearing your, your recordings with greater clarity actually helps you up your game as a performer. There's this wonderful feedback loop that happens in the abstract sense, not real feedback, where you're hearing yourself and thinking, ooh, I sound good. I'll perform better. And it just kind of creates this virtuous sort of circle of you continue to improve the better you sound to yourself. So, you know, the way that I look at this is sound quality counts for a tremendous amount. And here's another note. My experience is that the best, most emotional and most connected time to record your song is just after you have finished writing it. And before you've had too much time to think, or as I like to put it, overthink your song. So having a great portable mic on hand right then makes all the difference in the world. So speaking of making these polished rough recordings, these days, and this is really, and, and, and this happens um, basically every day, technology for recording gets better and more affordable. We just happen to be at a really, really great time where now you can use a high quality condenser microphone that can be connected directly to your smartphone or your tablet or your laptop. The nice thing about these high quality mics like the Shure Motive line is that they are small enough to always have them with you. As Laura mentioned earlier, I'm speaking now into a beautiful little uh, Shure MV5, which is a condenser microphone that is about the size of like a tennis ball. And I, I keep one of these uh, in my backpack when I travel and I always have it with me and it sounds great. Um, and because I'm lucky and I know the folks at Shure, I also have a couple of their other mics with me all the time. So I also have an MV88, which is a stereo mic that plugs directly into the end pin jack, your lightning port of your smartphone or your, or your iPad. And the MV51, which is a really solid, really beautifully built, high quality condenser microphone that, that works. I use it as a straight up vocal mic when I'm doing these recordings. So this idea of having a great microphone with you all the time um, makes a huge difference in terms of what you have in your toolkit when it's time to make this recording. So, Laura, before I go any further on this, am I missing anything that we should cover right now in terms of some of the Motive line? The strong features of the Motive line that I really love are that each microphone serves a different purpose, but some can also serve multiple purposes. Like our MV88 that you spoke of that plugs directly into an iPhone, it has switchable polar patterns, which essentially means that you can change how the microphone, which microphones are on, on this one little stereo condenser mic, uh, as far as it being a stereo pattern or a dynamic um, cardioid pattern. Uh, so it gives you the flexibility to change what you're doing. So if you're in a writing room with another writer and you want to capture the room ambience as well as the song itself, you can do that in stereo mode. But if you were at... Um, Let's say you were at a larger concert, you can switch it up as well uh, with some of the presets that are coming in the Motive app that we have to just bring everything down to a workable range so that you're not going to be overloading the mic. And, and that's something that is an advantage over using the microphone that comes with your device because honestly, our, our phones do have great microphones now, but... Um, when you use an external mic like the MV5 that we're using now, you're able to capture more richness and have a lot more flexibility uh, in the dynamic range that you're able to capture. So um, there's the MV88, as you mentioned, the MV5, which is a condenser, and the MV51, which is a large diaphragm condenser, which also has several presets, can sit on your desktop, can um, also be screwed onto a microphone stand. So everything is meant to be very flexible so that you can take it to uh, take it to your gigs, take it to your writing sessions and know that you're going to have that high quality sound uh, without any fuss and being able to plug it into either your laptop or your phone and be ready to rock. So that coupled with our audio apps, which give you that timestamp that you mentioned and our video app, if you're going to be doing um, any of that, I mean, it just makes capturing your, your creativity so much easier and sound so much better. 
And, you know, uh, Laura, as you're talking, I'm remembering that, that one of the things that you and I talked about when we did this um, workshop previously was the MVI also, which yeah. is, uh, why don't you tell the folks a little bit about that? Because that also, if you want to talk about flexibility, that thing's amazing. Sure. So the MVI is a way of plugging in an existing microphone. So let's say you have an SM58, one of our most popular microphones, uh, and you wanted to bring that to record with. So you would take the uh, SM58 and your MVI, plug the SM58 directly into the MVI, and then run a micro USB into your phone or your laptop. And it acts as an audio interface of sorts. There's also some great presets and some real-time monitoring, which is what I really like about uh, the MV5, the MV51, and the MVI specifically, you can monitor what you're putting into your device in real time just by plugging in a set of standard headphones directly into the microphone itself. So the MVI, you can use any existing microphone that you have. It also can provide phantom power. Um, and so it's just a really flexible tool to kind of keep in your, your toolkit. Great. Uh, so if we haven't missed anything on this part of it, why don't I talk to the folks a little bit about why it is important to care? Um, and, and, and then we can go on yeah. to some questions. So <clears throat> one of the things that I think um, can feel a little daunting to people who are longer on creativity and shorter on tech is, is this idea that, um, you know, you need to be a recording engineer to really understand this stuff. And, and the bottom line is that's not the case. You know, whether you're going to be a recording engineer or not, understanding the recording in the studio process is, is hugely important, not only to make some quality recordings, but to communicate your needs when it comes to recording your song. So the better able you are to show the singers and the players in a professional studio what your song sounds like, starting with these rough recordings that we've been talking about, the, the more likely you are to get what you want when it comes to your song demos. So um, learning enough and I'm not saying you need to necessarily go back to school to become an audio engineer, but but just learning enough to, to work these microphones and use them in conjunction with the Shure Motive app can make a huge difference. And, you know, if your goal is also to be a performer as well as a writer, you will really dramatically increase the likelihood that your recordings that you're doing with these mics will be good enough to pitch as is to the music industry decision makers if, in fact, you capture the magic in a given performance. So my way of looking at this is caring about all facets of the songwriting and recording process not only helps you prevent, pre prevent present your songs in the best light, <laughs> but it kind of marks you as the professional that will be taken seriously when it comes to your career. So now, why don't we um, pause and see if there are any questions? Okay, great. Um, we do have a couple of questions. Um, the first one here uh, is, uh, how would one go about go about copywriting a song? I know you mentioned that earlier, but um, can you talk any more about that process? Sure, and, and I get this question a lot. You know, uh, I'm going to start with a sort of a broader answer, and then I'll go about the nuts and bolts of describing copyright. So when, when I was new to writing songs, and I always use myself as the example, because if there is a mistake to be made, I have made it. When it comes to songwriting or the music business, every single one of the things that I talk about, if there is a way to make the mistake, I've done it. So I, when I would write a song, especially early on in my career, I would immediately wake up petrified that someone was going to steal it. And so I thought, well, I've got to immediately copyright this thing, otherwise my song will get stolen. And, and the reality is, I've been writing songs now for 25 years, and the only time I have ever had someone that I know have a song, and I wouldn't even use the word stolen, I would say part of their song was used in another song, was where my friend had a number one song that had been on the radio all over the world for basically years, and then another song used part of that song in their song, and it was also happened to be a hit. In other words, this is kind of the equivalent of hitting a bullet with a bullet. The likelihood of your song actually getting stolen is almost zero. The reason to copyright a song is when it becomes available for commercial release, when it's about to come out in a film or a TV show, or you put it out on an album that is, is going to be streamed on the, the streaming services or something like that. That is the time to copyright. Prior to that, 
It's not necessary. And I'll tell you why it's not necessary. First of all, it's expensive. I think it's up to like $55 to copyright a song now. Um, however, a little workaround is that you can copyright a group of songs together for that same fee. Right. right. And, and, and that is if you're about to release an EP or an album, that's the time to do this. But when to, to now very specifically answer the question, how do you go about copywriting it? You go to copyright.gov, I believe. Is that right, Laura? I think that's the website. And you can do this online through the through the register that of copyrights. Right. Yeah. But and, and, you know, I'm, I'm only kidding a little bit when I say as a beginning songwriter, I think your best bet is to worry about writing songs that people would want to steal. As, as opposed to worrying too much about <laughs> copywriting your songs. Okay. Well, and also, Cliff, there's also uh, the ability to register your songs ah, with your PRO. Which that's exactly right. So on. a PRO that Laura refers to is a performing rights organization, BMI, ASCAP, CSAC. And those organizations, you can only join one of them as a writer. They're, they are there to record and pay for your performance royalties. But one of the services that they offer all their members is the ability to register a song when it has been completed. So you can go onto the website and register your song with your PRO, whether it's BMI or ASCAP or CSAC, that is free to do. And it is also a record not only of the percentage of the song that is yours, if you've co-written it, but the date that you have registered that song, which is a way for free to also establish that your song is out in the world. Great. How's well, that for a really long answer to a very short question? Well, no, I think, I think it's a complicated <laughs> question. And yeah, I, I think that's a lot of great information. I didn't know any of that. So, hey, there we go. <laughs> All right. All right. N next question. And Excellent. I think this one, Laura, is something that you can actually help out a lot with because I know that you do a lot of, of recording yourself um, with video. Um, what model of condenser mic do you think is best if you want to record your songs to video and post them online? I'm looking for a condenser mic that uses XLR, but I'm also unsure of the best way to connect it because currently I am using dynamic microphones with PV speakers and a mixer. I'm planning on soundproofing a room in my house for recording purposes. Wow. Okay. Well, that sounds super fun, first off. But uh, we have a number of options. Of course, Shure is a microphone manufacturer. Uh, and some of our studio microphones, if you want to have the flexibility of taking it out into the studio as well as using Facebook Live um, or whatever live streaming you prefer, you could use essentially any of our condenser mics and run them into this MVI that I mentioned. So it, it works as an interface that could get that into your device. So what you would do is you would take your microphone, plug it XLR into the MVI, plug that into your device of choice because it can go to either your iPhone or your Android devices. And you can open up the, um, the Motive app to get the microphone settings where you want them to be, specifically let's say your gain for example, um, and you can enable the phantom power as well so that you can be driving that condenser microphone. Um, and then you would go to your streaming service and those microphone settings will carry over. So they'll overtake the microphone of your device and give you that high quality audio in your live stream. Um, so a KSM32 is what I'm using currently for my studio needs. It's an excellent microphone, um, but condenser mics we make Many, many. KSM 44 is, is Cliff's passion of that choice, I think, right now. True. Correct, Cliff? <laughs> Which is a beautiful and, and a little more on the, the pricier spectrum, but worth every penny. Um, so you can either use a high-quality studio condenser mic or um, you can use a lesser quality and, and still get that great sound using the MVI. Great. Awesome. Okay. Um is there a mic that will connect solidly without an OTG cable to an Android phone, making it a sturdy handheld recording or recorder? I'm not familiar yeah. with OTG. So, so yeah, means. to you know connect, I, I am. Um, so to connect our Motive microphones, um, because <laughs> the Android devices use uh, USB-C connections usually or micro B, um, you need to have what's called an OTG cable. Yes. So basically what that is is because the Motive microphones use micro B to USB out, um, so an OTG is then USB in 
to um, so it's a female USB uh, to then I believe a USB C connector. Um, so yeah, it's just an additional cable that's needed to make uh, pro- our products um, or any USB product I should say compatible for Android devices. Gotcha. So you should yeah. probably feel this um, one, Cheryl, because this is this is yes, like it is. Something um, you're unfortunately, familiar. we do not. Um, I and I am not. Uh, I am not personally familiar um, with any products on the market. That's not to say they aren't there. Um, it's just I'm I'm a little focused on sure products for some reason. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> but yeah, there might be something out there. Um, but there's nothing that I'm I'm aware of at this time. So, um, but thank you for your question. Um, so okay, uh, next question about the Motive apps. Um, once downloaded, can the app record without an internet connection? Yes, absolutely. Uh, the, the app is, is standalone, so you don't need an internet connection at all. The only reason you would need the internet connection would be to share it with the world or to stream live outside of that app. Exactly. As a matter of fact, Laura, if I'm not mistaken, it is a good policy, generally speaking, to uh, go into, on an iPhone anyway, airplane mode That's while correct. you are doing these recordings. So it's actually the opposite of an internet connection that you need right. while you're doing the recording. You right. need to be sort of set, set up to not have that connection so that your recordings don't get interrupted by a phone call or something like that. And that's an and excellent s- point, Cliff, especially um, with our <clears throat> video apps. It also reminds you, which is great, to put it into or suggest strongly to put it into airplane mode <laughs> so that you don't have any uh, interference. And I'll add an additional note to that. Um, with the MV88, it's even additionally more important that you put it in airplane mode because the MV88 connects at the bottom of the phone, which is the same place where the phone antennas are. Um, so if you're not in airplane mode, you not only oh. would you possibly be interrupted if you get a text or a phone call, but more likely you're going to be interrupted by GSM interference, which is sort of that you know digital bursting sort of sounds that we've, we're all familiar with and have heard before. Um, right. I do know sometimes people with the MV88 ask me, you know, well, what if I'm streaming live and, and how do I get around that? Um, what you can do is you can, if you're using Wi-Fi, um, that will, you can use Wi-Fi. So put your phone in airplane mode and then turn on Wi-Fi and then you won't be getting the 4G, the GSM interference. You'll just be streaming using the internet and not have those same issues. So Cool. Um, Any other questions? I think uh, we got to thank you for that last answer. So you're very welcome. Mm -hmm. Um, And I don't see any other questions. um, So I think that pretty much wraps it up. Did you guys have anything else you wanted to add before we signed off? Um, I think if anyone wants to learn more about the products, you can go to shore.com slash motive. uh, And Mm -hmm. there's a beautiful product page, which... Um, I think in our next presentation, I'll have actual visual aids so we can see what these look like. It's a little (laughs) tricky when we're not all in the same room together. Um, But so, yes, so learn more about all of the Motive products. And um, if you have any additional questions, uh, is there a way for people to to reach out, Cheryl? Yes. Yes. Yes, you can always reach our application support team at support at shore.com. Um, that's a really smart group of guys and gals uh, that work here that can answer just about any question about any product under the sun that we have. Um, they're really smart, and I know I rely on them for a lot of things. So you can always reach them very easily at support at shore.com. Cliff, anything else you'd like to say before we sign off? You know, I think one of the things that won't translate in a webinar um, is just how solid physically solid these mics are (laughs) yes you know it's not we're not talking about like a little fragile kind of light thing i mean the um very specifically like the mv51 you could actually you could do some damage in a bar fight with this thing this is a (laughs) serious piece of equipment all that to say, I think we you know, don't getting these things that, in your though. hand. We don't recommend. No, right. this is, <laughs> no, this, no, this is not, not something I'm weapon. suggesting. <laughs> um, but you really, they really are beautifully made. I mean, this is this is sure microphones we're talking about. This is a company that's been around for a long time and knows how to make a mic. It's not some aftermarket kind of oh, there's an iPhone out, let's make an accessory. These are serious microphones, and they they feel that way as well as work that way. Thanks, Cliff. Yeah, my favorite is when I'm showing the the, the the motive line to people for the first time and I'm showing them the MV51 and then I, I hand it to them and they're always like, what? What? Oh, and then they feel now the I get it. it. So, yes. yeah, yeah. 
Yes. yes. And the MV5, although it's a little bit smaller and lighter, what people don't realize is it does have um, an internal metal frame. So it's actually very sturdy as, as well with a little bit more of a portable portable side to it. So, yes, we build all of our things to last. Everything goes through the same kinds of drop tests and quality tests, and that's, that's very important to us here at Sure. All right, so we want to thank you so much for joining us today. Um, hope you learned a lot. We hope you get out there and start start making some great rough recordings and get your ideas out there. Um, as we mentioned, if you do have any additional questions, you can always reach out to us at support at shore.com. To see all of our webinars, you can go to shore.com slash training. Um, and I believe that wraps it up for today. So we want to thank you so much for joining us, and we hope to see you on the next one. Have a great day.